Hello, everyone, and welcome to CRC Music in the Studio. My name is Lisa Beebe, and I'm a professor of musicology and ethnomusicology here at CRC. And I'm really excited to welcome our special guest today, um, Dr. J. Arms. Um, Dr. Arms is a guitarist and an ethnomusicologist whose research focuses on experimental music in the United States. We'll hear more about that. Um, J. is currently a lecturer at the University of Pittsburgh, way over on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, where he teaches the University Gamelan um, and also classes on improvisation. We're talking um, at the very beginning, he's also teaching a senior seminar on musical instruments. We can tell us some more about that. Um, so welcome, Jay. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm excited to be here with everybody. This is great. So Jay and I went to graduate school together at UC Santa Cruz. We've known each other for a long time. So it's kind of fun to be like talking to each other in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So welcome, Jay. How, how's it going? It's going good. It's uh, getting chilly out here in Pennsylvania. It's full on fall. We have all the beautiful leaves and everything, but also temperature dropped about 15 degrees in the last two weeks. So oh time to wear our vests and look for our winter boots. <laughs> look very autumnal. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Awesome. So even though Jay is joining us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or actually from Pittsburgh, California. <laughs> yeah, not too far from y'all. <laughs> yeah, that's what, good. About 20 minutes down uh, 161 or whatever. So you're a local. So yep, yep, very familiar with the area. <laughs> so yeah, Jay, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the work that you do at the University of Pittsburgh. Sure. So I'm in the, the lecturer stream um, for the university and um, at Pitt, uh, these positions are sort of assigned based on the area. We have five different tracks within the, the undergraduate program. There's a performance track, there's a composition and theory track, there's a jazz studies track, there's a historical musicology track, and then I'm the lecturer for the ethnomusicology track. Um, so I advise the undergraduate students who might be interested in pursuing ethnomusicology as their focus or um, have an interest in the various world music ensembles we have here. Um, that's part of my job. Uh, so I often teach the um, introduction to world music class, much like the one that uh, Dr. Beebe teaches at CRC. Oh. Um, I also teach the University Gamelan Ensemble. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It's an ensemble of Indonesian percussion instruments. Um, that are quite fun and hopefully you'll get excited about them. And then the other part of my job is I'm the coordinator of public ethnomusicology here at Pitt. So I'm in charge of sort of well, coordinating various things related to public outreach and public work that we do here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so I've done a kind of mapping project of different musical communities in the Pittsburgh area. Um, I've, I've written a history about the ethnomusicology program here, and I'm reaching out to various parts of the community just to see what their needs are, what might the, the program here at Pitt do for them or help them with. Um, presently, we're trying to reach out to the Afghan community amid the, the ongoing refugee crisis to try and um, touch base with some of the musicians who will be arriving here in Pittsburgh. It's one of the sites that a lot of folks are going to be resettled over the coming months. So we're kind of getting ready for that and seeing what ethnomusicology can do for folks. Yeah, that's great. So really being part of the community and being a resource. Yeah, yeah. And just kind of being that point person of if you, if there's something you might need from the music department, yeah. you can contact me and vice versa. If, uh, a graduate student or faculty members looking for some sort of contact, I might be able to help point in the right direction. That's cool. We should talk about that word, ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology, <laughs> what is that? What the heck is ethnomusicology? <laughs> We're not making it up, we swear. Um, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. So, <laughs> Jay, what is ethnomusicology? What is ethnomusicology? <laughs> um, I think my favorite defin definition of ethnomusicology is simply the study of music and culture. Mm. Um, music doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? It's not just something you stick in your earbuds and you walk around and you sing and dance to it and then you kind of put it away. It, it interacts with human beings and it takes on various meanings for different kinds of human beings. So when we think about a song or a genre or an instrument, 
it really helps to think about the people who use it and why they use it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of how I think about ethnomusicology. There's a lot of history behind the term. There's a lot of debate around it. Um, um, some problematic aspects. A lot of folks assume because of the word ethno in there, they think it's the study of ethnic music. Mm -hmm. But any ethnomusicologist will tell you really quick, all music is ethnic music because <laughs> all humans have some sort of ethnic identity. Um, so it's not ethnic meaning like other people's music. Um, but historically, it sort of seems to replicate that idea because it's often the study of non-Western musics. But my research, for example, a lot of the folks I work with are born and raised in professional activities in the US and North America. Uh, I do do a lot of work with Indonesian scholars, but that can kind of came about through uh, my interaction with the American composers that I work with. So it's more about the way I'm thinking about it. It's not just here are these compositions by these composers and here's how the music works theoretically. It's how does this work um, within the community? How do the people think about it? What are they, what are their values? How is that expressed through their music? Yeah, it's a good way to describe it, you know, because you're asking questions about like, how does this music function within its cultural context? And I think that's what it comes down to is all academic disciplines have certain questions they ask about the world. And ethnomusicologists are asking, what, what sounds are we hearing? And, you know, what's, what's the purpose of these sounds? Who's making them? What kind of meanings might they have? Um, and you also brought up a really good point. That there's kind of this assumption that's like, well, ethnomusicology is music that's not made in Europe or North America. Um, and musicology is everything else. And unfortunately, we kind of see this dichotomy, for lack of a better word, replicated sometimes in our curricula, right? In our curriculum. So for example, I teach a world music class, which I love, <laughs> you teach a similar class. Oh, all music is world music. So it's kind of an odd term. And we have a one world music class often in a college, but then we have European music history classes and we might have four or five of those. So some things that I guess our discipline is grappling with a little bit. One of the favorite um, case studies that I do in my world music class is the section on Irish music, Irish traditional music. Um, so often I'll, we'll get to that part of the class and I'll have a student come and say, why are we talking about this? This isn't ethnomusicology, but it very much is in a lot of ways. Because A, Irish traditional music is not the same thing as Western classical music, broadly speaking. Sometimes you might see something notated using staff notation, but traditionally it wasn't really done that way. Uh, Irish traditional music functions at the level of a local community, and there are different styles throughout the, the, uh, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, really characteristic of a specific city or a county or even a, like a family lineage. And um, looking at that music through an ethnomusicological lens kind of reveals it to be really different from something like Mozart or Beethoven, and there's a lot more in common with um, even other parts of the world, because Ireland does have a colonized past. Right. Mm -hmm. They were colonized by the United Kingdom, or England is now yeah. the United Kingdom, um, much like India or, or parts of Africa or the US. And that context can reveal other things about that music that you won't necessarily get if you're just thinking about the, the classical composers and, and those works. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man, this is cool. Jane Lee said, deep dive into ethnomusicology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So maybe now that we've geeked out for a few minutes, let's let's throw it back. Um, sure. So we know what you're doing now. Um, we know you're working now and the kinds of questions you're asking about music. Um, but let's throw it back to young Jay, <laughs> tiny Jay in Pittsburgh, California. Um, obviously, music is a important part of your life, studying it, making it, teaching it. How did you get started being involved with music and kind of you know, how did you, how did you get to where you are now? Well, I come from a fairly musical family, which I know is a very cliche thing to say, but it, it's pretty true. My earliest memory, I must have been about three years old. Um, I it was at the local community theater, Pittsburgh Community Theater, uh, PCT, over not too far from y'all. Um, it was a production of The Wizard of Oz. And I remember very vividly a family friend of ours who was playing Dorothy and she was singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow and that mm. it's crystal clear in my brain but I must have been about three years old at the time mm. um, and at that production my grandma was playing piano in the pit 
that that's what she did. My aunt was the director of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer was a close friend of ours. My mom did the costumes. Um, so throughout my childhood, we were really involved with the musical theater and we did all the big shows. We did Joseph and the Amazing Technical Dreamcoat, Fiddler on the Roof, Oliver, like all the big shows. And that was just part of our routine. They, every weekend we'd be at the theater and all those songs would be on the CD player or cassette in the early days <laughs> in the car while we're driving around. Um, my grandmother is probably the most important early musical influence for me and through, by extension through the rest of my family because she has a master's in piano performance. Mm. I'm from the University of South Dakota. Um, and she taught everyone in my family piano at a young age. I think I was five or six when I got started and stuck with it for a few years and sort of fell off of it. I became disinterested with the piano. I can never really get my hands together. Um, but I remember those piano lessons very much. And by the time I was 12 or 13, I wanted to get back into music. I sort of discovered CDs and I started buying them with a friend and um, got really obsessed listening to things over and over and over again, trying to figure it out and um, picked up the guitar. My mom had an old guitar in the closet that she still has. And um, when I was 13, um, my friend and I became eligible for a program at our local community college, Los Medanos College, not, also not far from you guys. Yeah. And we enrolled in guitar classes there. We took two classes. We took guitar, group class guitar, and basic math, because we could oh. take those classes for high school credit mm -hmm. and start you know, building up towards graduation. And so every semester we take a music class and a, a math or science class. And after the first year, I was hooked. I, I got an electric guitar for Christmas that year, started shredding. My friend sort of got more into filmmaking and set his guitar aside for a while, but I kept going. And uh, by, by the time I graduated high school, I was full on Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> 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 I was going for it. And then I got from there, I got into jazz and that's where I learned to read music. It's where mm -hmm. I learned more complex chord structures and got into improvisation. Um, Got to UC Santa Cruz for, um, you know, my the rest of my undergraduate transferred from from Los Medanos and got into classical guitar and that's sort of my main performance outlet now. I have these <laughs> these nails that you can see uh, even on Zoom, and um, that's sort of where my performance is now and as a solo musician. But it all got started at a community college class guitar room. Like, Hope so maybe many of you are in. <laughs> shout out to dual enrollment and shout out to group guitar, right? Because that's important work. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's awesome. And I have one of your albums here. Found it. Yeah. <laughs> so was this your first album that you made? That was my first and only full length album of solo music. Actually, there's one duo on there. My friend Carl Spiker plays oboe on one of the pieces, yeah. um, and I I made that album shortly after uh, my senior recital. I, did, I ended up doing a performance degree on classical guitar, even though I almost quit music when they told me I had to learn classical guitar when I joined, I was so mad. I'm like, no, I'm an electric guitarist, I play jazz, no. Nope. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, Interesting, you came to love it, even though at first you were forced into it. Something about it, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just, I love playing and making music. And as I got better at it, I started to enjoy that that mode more. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to document that because I, I knew by the time my recital came around that I wasn't going to be a professional musician. Although I, I technically speaking, I could have gone that route, but I ended up getting carpal tunnel in my wrist and oh, was getting a little bit tired of eight hour practice days. But I wanted to document what I had accomplished because I knew I was probably never going to be playing at quite that level again with that kind of mm -hmm. consistency going into a more academic discipline. So I said, I'm like, okay, I got to make a CD, like make sure it's it's there. Yeah. And I did. That's cool. So if, you know, we have students here who might be considering making an album of their own. I know we have a lot of students who are already doing recording projects. Any kind of hard earned practical advice <laughs> that you would give to <laughs> folks? I mean, for making a, an album, mm -hmm. um, don't make CDs. <laughs> <laughs> I did this in 2012, which is sort of like the very end of the CD era. And I, 
and they, they get you with the price breaks because it's like it's so much money for this amount. And then if you get like double that, it's only a little bit more rather than double the price. So I ended up with, I don't know, 500 or a thousand CDs or whatever. And I've sold maybe 80 of them. <laughs> like, so where are just they don't all have now? a way to listen to it. Um, where are all these like treasure trove of CDs now? And some of them are in my closet over there. Yeah. I have a box of them over here. Um, they basically serve as expensive business cards okay. and you, you, you give them away. Um, I was at the end of the CD era and the beginning of the digital download era. Mm -hmm. So um, CD baby is still around, but it's not the cool thing. If you're going to do it, get somebody who can record it. Uh, first of all, get someone who knows what they're doing with the record. Don't do it yourself. You might have garage band on your, your Mac, but don't, don't do it. <laughs> like, it's a real skill and takes years of training to, be really good at it. Um, get somebody who can help you with it and make sure you pay them because it is real labor. Don't just you know mooch off your friends and uh, aim for a digital release on Bandcamp or something. Mm. Um, that platform is much less expensive because you don't have the physical production value and it also has a wider reach. Mm. Um, that'd be my, my, my advice if I were to do this now, which I did recently with a friend. We made yeah. an EP. Of, I was going to say, maybe it's a perfect segue. Tell us yeah. about your recent project. Yeah, my actually a mutual friend I have with Lisa, Marguerite Brown, who's a composer, um, now based in San Diego. She's pursuing a doctorate down there. We recorded three duos at the very end of my graduate work at UC Santa Cruz. And they're, they're weird pieces. They're weird pieces. Music, unlike anything you've heard in a lot of cases. There's um, Every piece is for two guitars, but each one is like two different guitars and each piece is in a different weird tuning. So one of them is two electric guitars, but one of them is tuned like a sixth tone down. So if you divide like a half step by six, it's like one sixth of a half step down. Oh, and it makes this really weird tuning and a lot of interesting harmonies that you're able to produce that way. Another one, um, Marguerite completely refretted a guitar, like put the frets in different places for a tuning that she invented. And that matched with another weirdo guitar tuning refretted by a composer named Lou Harrison. Mm -hmm. um, so that piece can only be played if you have those two very specific guitars, which oh. not too many of those. And then another one, I made an arrangement of a piano piece for two regular classical guitars, but I tuned my E string down to C. So a full mm -hmm. six down so I can get this really nice low sound trying to imitate the piano a little bit. That's awesome. So if folks want to check out this album, because you said it's on Bandcamp. It's on Bandcamp, yeah. yeah. You have to search for Marguerite Brown. Okay. Um, it's on her page. Cool. And it's cool. called Three Hockets. Three they all interlock in, in some way. And we'll make sure to drop a link to that in the chat later on. So if folks want to check it out. Also, um, I see some folks adding questions and nice comments in the chat. So mm -hmm. please feel free to have those. any questions. Yeah, for day, um, you know, let us know in the chat and, and we'll get to your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, that'd be awesome. So, um, you know, we've already talked a little bit about some of your, your academic trajectory and with guitar, um, some of the projects you were working on. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, gamelan. Sure. What's a gamelan, Jay? <laughs> well, it might be easiest to show what a gamelan is. Maybe we'll okay. segue into um, the, the video of my class. Okay. So a gamelan is a kind of ensemble from Indonesia. Um, Indonesia, if you're not sure where it is, is a large archipelago nation um, in Southeast Asia. It's sort of between Australia and Thailand. It's made up of 17,000 islands and all sorts of different music. Um, so the ensemble that I teach is a Sundanese gamelan ensemble. It's um, music of the Sundanese people of the Western third of the island of Java, um, which you probably heard of through coffee, right? You have a cup of Java. Yeah comes from this place called Java. Um, so the gamelan comes in a lot of different forms. Um, the, the ensemble you're gonna see is called the gamelan de Goon. And um, this is um, a small version of the ensemble. Some of them can be much bigger with like two or three times as many instruments. Um, historically, it was associated with the sort of kingdoms of West Java. It was court music. Mm -hmm. um, today, it's, it's sort of a, Hmm, how do you want to say it? There's a lot of different genres for it, but it's it's more popularized. There are a lot, there are new compositions for Dagoon. There's Dagoon being mixed with other sorts of 
uh, ensembles. There's a sort of classic genre, which is not classical in the sense of super old, because all these pieces were made in the 50s. Okay. Um, so a lot, it's, it's really contemporary music is what I'm trying to say. It, it may sound, or you may assume that it's an older style, but it's actually very new. Um, Interesting. Oh, cool. So there are then different approaches for these contemporary compositions, some trying to harken really. back to a whatever classical yeah, style. Yeah, yeah. Um, Not to overcomplicate it, but the, yeah. um, the song you're going to hear um, in this one is called Paxi Tuwung. I'm going to another piece called Panglima, which ironically is not part of the Dagoon repertoire, but it sounds really beautiful on, on this, these instruments and in this scale. Um, mm -hmm. But Paxi Tuwung um, sim it simply is the name of a species of bird of paradise. Mm -hmm. Indonesia is one of these parts of the world where those species live and exist. These, like, these birds with gorgeous plumage and really bizarre mating habits. There are several thousand different types of them. And Paxi Tuwung is the name of one of them that lives in West Java. Um, so a lot of pieces are sort of named that way for, for birds that are around or for um, a princess from uh, a particular story or a uh, Hindu deity from the Mahabharata because Java has a, a rich Hindu past. Um, various things like that, but, or even just after a fruit. There's one of my favorite pieces called Jaruk Manis, which means sweet oranges. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's awesome. Well, yeah, let's um, let's give it this piece a watch and a, a listen. Um, yeah. Ensemble, the Degung Ooh. Ensemble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing to add, this, this performance was made last spring oh. um, when Pitt was still in its remote posturing for the COVID-19 pandemic and is sort of the result of what we had to do to manage everyone's safety and still somehow teach uh, world music. So you're gonna see all of the performers are wearing masks, they're sitting much farther apart than they usually would. And they learned most of this music um, without actually being able to play the instruments. They had to learn it from home by ear on a flute instead of the instruments that they're actually playing. And we got to rehearse about once a week for a few weeks before we actually had to go do this. Wow. So it was, cool. it was a major challenge, but they, they really pull it off. That's awesome. So this, what we're about to see is the result of resilience. Yes. <laughs> wow. That's great. And what's one thing, one or two things that folks at home who are watching um, should maybe watch out for or pay attention to while they're yeah. watching this? So gamelan music is very structured. Um, and it's structured around the big gong. You'll see in the back, there's a really large gong instrument and it's gonna be played very infrequently. Um, but whenever it's struck, it's marking the end of a cycle, the end of a, a section of music. And when they, all the performers get to that point and the gong is struck, they're going back to the beginning of the form and going through it again. Oh. And this piece is a fairly long cycle. So you're not gonna hear, hear that gong um, played very often. And then these other instruments that kind of look like gongs are sort of marking moments within that gong cycle, mm -hmm. important moments that the other musicians are sort of playing to. So mm -hmm. I think even just from that description and kind of watching and listening, you'll be able to get a sense of how, how the music is composed. That sounds great. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Um, so Gabriel, if you wouldn't mind queuing up that video. Thanks.
Unmuted. That was awesome, Jay. Yeah. Wow, great job to those students. I gotta say, like they really pulled it off. That was that was the A team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the A team. So the whole class was just great. Wow, that's awesome. And when you were talking about how the students had to learn this music on their own and then come together, how is that different from usually how an, an, a gamelan ensemble would learn to play this music together? So usually, when you learn, you learn sort of on the cuff, you show up, you sit down at one of those instruments and I show you what to play. And, mm -hmm. and that's how you learn it. There's no notation or anything. Um, it's just learning by ear, by physical, physically doing it mm -hmm. and doing it over and over again. One of the nice things about playing a cyclic music is just keep going. And if you miss it, it'll, it'll come around again <laughs> and you can try again. Yeah. That's cool. Wow. Um, one of the, the questions in the Q&A is about the names of the instruments. Uh, I think I'll address that now. The one in the back, the big gong, that's called the gong agung, which literally means big gong. <laughs> and in Sunda, gong is spelled with two O's because they really accentuate that gong sound. When you hit that gong, it goes bo So the, the word is an onomatopoeia. It, it sort of evokes the sound that the instrument makes. The smaller gongs hanging in the back are called jenglong, which I love to say, jenglongs, like the jangly things hanging in the back. The smaller pot gongs in the, in the middle, in the sort of um, square shape, those are called bonang. And that's generally the leader of the ensemble, not in this context, but often is. And then the other two instruments with the keys, those are called, um, generically, you can call them sauron, like the villain in Lord of the Rings, okay. Sauron. Here, um, they're slightly different though. One of them goes up a little bit higher in range and that's called a pecking. 
-hmm. And the, the other one goes a little bit lower and that's called a ponderous. The ponderous is sort of playing the main melody at the beginning. Da, 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 dee, da, 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 da. That's the ponderous. And I noticed they, um, the sound players hit the key and then they stop it with their hand. You got to both play the sound and stop the sound. So you're constantly doing this dance with your hands where you're playing a note and then you're stopping the note you just played when you play the next note. Yeah. And it's probably the hardest part about gamelan at first. But yeah, once yeah. once you get the muscle memory down, it, you don't even think about it. But at first it's like, oh my gosh, my hands are doing so many things. What's going on? <laughs> and the, the last instrument is the drums, which are called kendang. Mm -hmm. And it's just three barrel shaped drums, one big one, two small ones. And you get different sounds out of it. Awesome. So how did you get involved with gamelan? Um, first time I, the first time I got involved with gamelan was when I transferred to UCSC. I mentioned earlier that um, I was really upset that I had to learn classical guitar. And um, part of the reason for that was it was like a total reset on my musical development up to that point. I was fairly good at electric guitar. I could play in a band, you know, I could play all the complicated solos. I had my technique down. I was learning to improvise. And then when I started taking classical guitar, I had to completely relearn my technique. So I was sitting there for the first semester doing this. Oh. <laughs> just to get the right hand technique down because I'm not playing with a pick anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and that's very annoying. <laughs> Worthwhile in the long term because now my right hand technique is great. Mm -hmm. But it was really frustrating at first. And because I was so new to it, my teacher who also directed the classical guitar ensemble said, you have to wait till next semester to, to take the ensemble. Mm -hmm. But I need an ensemble to get the degree. I need to be in an ensemble every single quarter. Yeah. Um, so I auditioned for the jazz ensembles and guess what? There are two of them and the guitar spots always go to the seniors because there's a line and you got to get in line. Mm -hmm and junior transfers are at the back of the line. <laughs> so didn't get to play in there. So I went to my advisor and said, how am I supposed to do this? And she says, go to Undang, who's the gamelan teacher. Tell him Amy sent you and you'll, you'll be in that ensemble. It's really fun. You don't need any experience. Just go do it. And it may, who knows, maybe you'll like it and you'll stick with it. <laughs> and I had no idea what she was talking about. I had never heard the word gamelan in my entire life. I'm like, what is, what are these weird instruments, this weird tuning? I don't get it. Um, but, you know, an ensemble is an ensemble. It was as good as anything for the degree and I needed something. So I went, I got into the ensemble and by the end of that 10 week quarter, all these drum patterns were just embedded in my brain forever. And all the, the patterns of the other instruments, because they all play very idiomatically. The piece might be different, but the way you play it is sort of the same. Um, when I came back to it years later, because I stopped after that quarter, as I got into the classical guitar ensemble, I needed to focus, you know, become a good guitar player. I came back to it in 2014, uh, mostly looking for a kind of social ensemble where I could just hang out with my friends and go eat burgers afterwards. <laughs> and two hours a week was a great uh, commitment level for somebody uh, trying to get their doctorate, as yeah. Lisa can attest to. It's uh, a lot of time spent by yourself in the library. So gamelan was a great opportunity for that. I could go play music with friends in low stakes environment. And then I got really into it and it became part of my research, uh, mm. sort of by accident. <laughs> yeah, no, Everyone has a story like that though. Everyone who, who does something like this, they, there was some moment where they just by chance stumbled upon this thing and it sort of took over their lives in some way. Yeah, and it's become such a, I don't know, a big part of your life. I mean, not just in the yeah. music that you create and study, but also now that you you teach, right? Because yeah. now you're leading. How has it been transitioning from being part of the ensemble to being a teacher and leading an ensemble of your own? Well, I'm standing in a long shadow. My teacher, Undang Sumarna, um, was sort of a superstar before he came to the US. When he was a teenager and in his early 20s, like he was already leading international ensembles on these massive tours, you know, playing big festivals and big concerts and making his living doing that. Um, and he came to the US in 1974 for the very first time and then moved here permanently in 1976 and just started teaching American beginners about gamelan. Like he's still a really incredible musician and he's still really well known in Indonesia and he goes back, you know, fairly frequently and still performs, but 
spends most of his time here teaching beginners. And um, I'm part of a long list of undergraduate students who just happened upon his classroom and became ethnomusicologists working on gamelan. Henry Spillers at UC Davis, not too far from you. Um, my colleague here at the University of Pittsburgh also studied with Undang. That's a big reason why I ended up here in this job was that connection. Um, uh, Gina Fatone at Bakes College in Maine, uh, Sean Williams at Evergreen College in Washington. That means that anybody in the US who's teaching Sundanese music studied with Undang. <laughs> it, um, and it's an ever growing scene. And some people have come back to graduate school at Santa Cruz just so they can spend more time with Undang and learn more from him. He's really an amazing teacher. And for him, it's just second nature. He's been doing it for so long. He's been doing it since he was a kid. His grandfather was a really important Sundanese composer in the 20s. Um, and I try and sort of emulate his teaching a little bit. Whereas, you know, we'll show up to class and he'll just say, okay, do this. Now you do that and you do this. And all of a sudden the piece is happening. And you're like, <laughs> what happened? How did this work? Because it just kind of throws you into the deep end and all of a sudden you're doing it, but you don't really know what or how or why. And I try and do that a little bit, but I'm such a novice by comparison. You know, I've only been doing it for a few years and he's been doing it his whole life and everything I know comes from him and he has all this other experience. So there's a balance um, where I can do that at the beginning and then it quickly gets to the point where I'm coming up to the end of what I know and can give to these students. And I say, go to Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, have to, you have to take it on your own now. There's only so far I can take you. But what we're doing in World Music Ensemble is not trying to produce a bunch of undang sumarnas to go play professionally in these Sundanese puppet theaters or anything like that. We're teaching culture. Mm -hmm. And one way of doing that is learning this music. So even the small amount that I can give these students is worthwhile and can open their ears and open their minds a little bit to learn something more about the world and about music. That's awesome. And, and I imagine too, for the students, I mean, what a great experience, right? You come in and you learn to play an entirely new to you style of music and walk away at the end, being able to have you know, been a part of that video or right? have something to show for it, which is really awesome. One of the great things about it is like, I, I do get music majors in there, you know, mm -hmm. students who are really into the piano or they're, you know, they're on the conservatory violin track or whatever. And all of a sudden they're challenged in what they think they know about music because mm -hmm. they've been doing it this way for so long that all of a sudden, wow, there's this other way of feeling the beat. Mm -hmm. Something as similar as counting to four. It's different in gamelan music. It's, uh, it happens at the end instead of the beginning. That's, that's too much. Mm -hmm. um, but then I get the students who've never once picked up an instrument in their whole life and consider themselves unmusical. And often they can become some of the best musicians in the class because mm -hmm. they, they can pick up these instruments and there's this other way of kind of thinking about the music and all of a sudden they're being musical. And that's really mm -hmm. exciting to see. Um, you, so it, it, it speaks to a different kind of musicality and a different way of being musical and kind of proves to me that we're all musical. You don't have to be born into a, a lineage of musicians and like, like me, my grandmother taught me piano. Like you don't have to do that to be a musician. Mm -hmm. That ties in really nicely with a question <laughs> that I, I try to ask all of our guests, which, um, you know, what advice you've, you know, you, you're a local, <laughs> so to speak, in Sacramento, right? You did dual enrollment, you earned your associates for transfer and mm -hmm. got your bachelor's at Santa Cruz and your master's and your PhD, and now you are a professor, right? You've mm -hmm. done all these all this work and have all these amazing experiences, what kind of advice do you have for students who are just starting out? Like maybe they're just starting their musical journey or maybe they're not a music major, but music is a really important part of their life and they want to incorporate it into their lives even if it's not as part of college study. Well, it's a big question, but like <laughs> what it sort of advice would, would you give to students? Well, my cliche advice will be don't stop learning and don't pigeonhole yourself into one thing or another. Um, as I've sort of talked about, I started off on an old beater guitar my mom had in the closet. I was just learning basic chord stuff and I got into electric guitar and I was a big metal head in high school and thought I was gonna be a rock star. And then I thought, oh no, I'm gonna be a jazz guitarist. I'm gonna, I, I went really deep into jazz and then I picked up classical and that's where my CD is. 
And now I'm teaching Indonesian music professionally. Like I'm paid to do this. <laughs> like, yeah. And all of that is because I never shut the door on anything. I never said, I don't do that, or I'm not interested in that. that those were not words in my vocabulary throughout my professional experience. And even now, I, I have a job. I have a good job. It's steady. It's consistent. I have really great colleagues. I'm still developing new skills. This, this year, 2021, I've started to learn computer programming. And yeah. now I can do some stuff in Python. And I, I have the whole data visualization thing in our language. I'm showing like different um, immigrant communities in Pennsylvania counties. It's like, never thought I would do that stuff. But I just never said no to something. I realized that I have an interest there and started developing these skills. And that, that trait has always served me well, that adaptability to be able to pick up something totally unfamiliar and just throw myself into it. So I would encourage you to lean into that aspect of your personality if, if it's something that you have or try and open yourself up to that. I mean, Lisa, you're similar where you just dove into Vietnamese music and developed this amazing dissertation about it um, coming from the French Baroque. Like, <laughs> there's a very obscure connection, but it was really valid and it, it, it took you in exciting places. Yeah, and sometimes you just have that moment where something grabs you and you want to learn more and more about it. And then next absolutely, thing you know, it's absolutely. your life. <laughs> and it wasn't always going to be music for me. For a while, I thought maybe I'd go into political science because I got really interested in politics and, in high school and early college you know, right around when I hit voting age and mm -hmm. thought that would be a really cool way to go and could have done that. Or um, I got really interested in astronomy and astrophysics. And if it weren't for the math, I might have done that. <laughs> I might have gone that way. Um, you know, just never, never close the door on things. I mean, at a certain point, you can't do everything, right? Yeah. You can't be a jack of literally all trades. But if you know you want to do music, don't just say, okay, I am doing this kind of music. Mm -hmm. um, the more you do, the better the better your options will be, yeah. the more opportunities will kind of afford themselves to you. That's great advice, <laughs> I will say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then get kind of piggybacking on that too, you know, you, um, you transferred, you, you know, finished your associates and you transferred to a UC. Yeah. Um, just broadly speaking, you know, as someone who's gone through the transfer process, what did you learn what sorts of advice might you have um, for you know students who are finishing their associates at a community college and hoping to transfer um, to a four-year school um speak frequently with advisors and make sure you know as much or more than them about the process you're trying to go through mm -hmm. Um, your advisors are your best resources to knowing what schools um, have agreements with your college um, there are these things, I can't remember what the transfer agreement guarantees, tags. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be called something different at CRC, but it's basically a list of classes. If you take these classes at CRC, then um, the UC system or the CSU colleges or UOP or especially like local colleges, stuff in your area will guarantee you admission. So you can kind of sidestep the whole application process. And then when you get there, they'll honor your general education requirements and you can focus on your major. That's super important and don't take it for granted. Um, I ran into an issue when I was transferring that there were two forms at um, my community college, so the Contra Costa district. So a different district, so probably different forms from you. Um, but there was one for the UC system and one for the CSU system. And they were basically identical. There's almost no difference except for one really important thing that became a sticking point which is there's like a section for arts and humanities. And I was using two of the music classes I took to fulfill one for the humanities and one for the arts. Mm -hmm. And on the UC form, I could do that. The two music classes could count. On the CSU form, the Cal State University form, the, those classes could both count for the arts one, but not the humanities one. Oh, I see. So I got in a fight with the, um, the advisor who was counting whether or not my transfer agreement was going to happen and what classes I would have to take when I get to UCSC on the other end. 
And based on that little clerical thing would have cost me tens of thousands of dollars and another couple of years of school. But I'm like, no, this form says this. And I'm on the phone with her, like making this point. And she's looking at the CSU form the whole time. And it was just very scary and very frustrating. And I could totally see a situation where somebody who just took their advisor's advice, but didn't necessarily know the minutia of those forms could get in a lot of trouble. So you have to take responsibility for your goals there. But I don't want to diminish what the advisors do because the work is so important and they know the directions that you can go and they can really help you with that. But once you have a direction, say, okay, I really want to go to UCLA. I want to do this kind of degree. Like, make sure you know all those details. Yeah. Like, once you get that down. That's great advice. You know, <laughs> all students listening, make an appointment with a counselor, do it early, do it often. Go to a counselor, then, do it yeah, at least once awesome. a year, if not once a semester, and then then take charge of your destiny. <laughs> yeah, take charge, be responsible. They, they can't do it for you. They're seeing people every single day. They make mistakes. It's not their fault. Their jobs are really hard, but they're, they can really help you. <laughs> Say thank you to them, bring them chocolates. And also... <laughs> we'll get better advice too, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's great, cool. Oh, wow, Jay, we've talked about like so many different things. Um, should we see if we have any questions in the Q&A box? Let's see. Someone asked what your favorite musical is. Yeah, I saw this, this earlier and it really depends on what we're talking about, <laughs> like what point in my life we're talking about. Um, you know, I have certainly just, the ones that are nostalgic for me, which are all the ones I kind of mentioned earlier, Joseph and the Amazing Technical, The Dreamcoat, Fiddler on the Roof, Oliver, all the ones that I was in or around when I was a kid, Guys and Dolls, like I can still sing any of those songs. They're just, they're here forever. Mm -hmm. um, as I've grown up and you know heard more and learned more about music, um, Stephen Sondheim is really top of the list for me, and his music is so interesting. I think his place in American music history is still not really at the level of where he's at as, a, as an artist. Yeah. Um, just so clever, so interesting. Um, listen to some Stephen Sondheim. <laughs> yeah, favorite Sondheim musical? You know, I love the second act of Into the Woods. The first act is always performed. And if you don't know that musical, it's it's a fairy tale. It brings together um, Jack and the Beanstalk and Cinderella and all these different fairy tale things and shoves them into a narrative. And the first act is the essentially a self-contained play and has a happy ending and blah, blah, blah. And then the second act, like everything goes wrong. The giant is murdered and then his wife shows up to try and kill Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk because he killed her husband. <laughs> and um, it gets really dark and much more adult than your typical fairy tale. And it's it's really funny. They sacrifice the narrator to the giant <laughs> and like, break the fourth wall. <laughs> it's very, very, very fun. Yeah, I do love it. Also that. Company, it's a whole musical that takes place in like five seconds. It's uh, <laughs> conceptually very cool. I like Sunday in the Park with George. I think that that's also cool. great. I mean, they're all good. Actually, I, I don't care for a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. I think it's a little fluffy and pretty offensive. But <laughs> Everybody's got their early work that they're like, mm -hmm, yeah, or something that you 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 just wrote because somebody paid you to do it. You know, <laughs> the gig economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like a lot of different musicals, though. That's great. Are you still involved with musicals in any way? My sister runs a theater company in Martinez, California. Uh, called Poison Apple Productions. They, they focus on um, children's theater. So they do a lot of educational programming. They have a writer's workshop to like learn to write plays. Um, they do some productions with adults. Um, it started off as a vessel for my sister to have her own plays produced. And um, keep an eye out. They come to Sacramento every year as part of the JTF competition, the Junior Theater Federation. It happens at the convention center in Sacramento. Okay. So. <laughs> cool. Shout out to Poison Apple and Noel. Yeah. So yeah, it's still very much part of my life. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So kind of support the family. Yeah. Um, and then we also have a question here in the chat about, you know, the, the piece you shared with us, um, mm -hmm. the Dagoon Ensemble, um, a question about some of the cultural expressions and, and meanings of Javanese culture that come through there, or I guess in this instance, it would be Sundanese. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. culture. Um, and maybe you could share with us a little bit too, you know, how, 
what are some of the other contexts for hearing gamelan? I know you mentioned uh, shadow puppets. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you could just tell us a little bit more about how gamelan fits into a, a wider context. Yeah. So there are a lot of different forms and genres of Sundanese music. Dagoon is one. And those are the instruments that you saw. It's associated with that scale, that size of ensemble. Usually you'd want um, a bamboo flute called suling to be kind of acting as a soloist. Um, wind instruments are not so good during the pandemic, so we just omit that. Um, this, the piece that we played, though, is not part of the Dagoon repertory. Mm -hmm. It's part of a different genre of Sundanese music, generically called salendro, which is the name of a different kind of scale, too. Um, the basic difference, you have two main scales, you have Slendro and Paylog. I'm kind of oversimplifying here, but two main ones. Um, Slendro is sort of like a pentatonic scale. Like if you went to a piano and you played C, D, E, G, A, C, D, E, G, A, yeah. It's sort of Slendro-y, but not exactly, but sort of that. So no half steps. Um, Paylog has a bunch of half steps in it. So it's a very different kind of quality. Dagoon is a kind of Paylog, but different. In fact, it, Pelag is more associated with central Java. So in Sunda, if you're playing that scale, you're going to call it Pelag Jawar, which is the Sundanese word for Java. Oh, um, so that's maybe a little too much detail. So the song that we played, Paxi Tubung, is actually part of the Solendro repertory and is often played on that Pelag Jawar scale. Um, and it's sort of one of these big pieces that you can kind of play over a long period of time and you can segue to a different piece like Panglima, which is just sort of a generic structural piece um, that you can loop over and over again. You can change how long the gong cycle is. One of the cool things about Sundanese music is that it represents um, sort of different conceptions of time. Mm -hmm. So the cycle that we are playing there is every 16 beats, there's a gong. Oh, okay. Every 16 beats, there's a gong. And you call that sa will it. Sa meaning one and will it meaning the name of this particular concept. Mm -hmm. And it's a particular view of time. Over 16 beats, this is happening. But we can cut that in half, make it a half a willet, called kring. Mm -hmm. And then it's all of a sudden eight beats per gong. So the same kind of music happening in twice the speed. And you play it differently because you can't play everything that fast. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also expand it, make it longer. Instead of 16 beats, make it 32 beats. So same music, but over twice the amount of time. Dual willet, two willets. And then you can go out again and call it Mpot Will. And then you have 64 beats. And you can go out again to 128 beats. And you can go out again to 256 beats. And they get longer and longer and longer. And so this is sort of like a cosmological view of the universe. Like, like if you ever do one of those power of tens things where you, you're looking at somebody in the park and you zoom out and you see a bit more of the park. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, the park's in Chicago. And then it's North America. And then before you know, it's the whole earth and then the solar system. Like mm -hmm. the same basic, like, cosmological view of the universe is inherent in these structures. It comes from Hinduism. Um, as I mentioned, Java has a Hindu past. Today, it's predominantly Islamic, but they've maintained a lot of these sort of concepts from Hindu cosmology um, that, of course, puts Java at the center of the universe. <laughs> and everything sort of expands from there. Um, so whether you're playing in one of these willets, you're going to play slightly differently, but the structure is the same, and the gong happens in that same spot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it, the gong is going to happen at the same spot. It just the frequency of the gong depends on what type of will you're using. What type of will you're playing. And then the other instruments play more or less notes, depending on how much time they have. If they're playing in half will, it might be one, like just eight notes per gong. In saw will, it may be 16 notes per gong. Or So like is a change in rhythmic density? Change in rhythmic density, yeah. If there's more space, play more notes. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> You got a little bit of that in Paxi Tuwong. The gongs come more frequently when you transition to Panglima. Mm. Oh, in the, in the example we saw. Or, or, or saw yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering while I was listening. I feel like I'm hearing the gong more often now. Um, if we have time for that other video, I don't know, it's getting close to the top of the hour. Um, we, we execute that concept um, mm -hmm. in a different piece. So you can kind of hear it a little bit more, but maybe, maybe, maybe we, can, a... we could end with that. Maybe we could play ourselves sure. out as an example, if, yeah. if that's okay with you. That's fine by me. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? 
And we got to all the questions in the Q&A and I think we are set in the chat. There were like a million more things I wanted to talk about, like improvisation and your phone <laughs> and you, but An hour just flies by. <laughs> yeah, an hour flies by and we can always be over. We can try to talk about musical episodes of The Simpsons. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. That's a whole separate in the studio um, presentation. Well, my my quick answer to that is the Planet of the Apes musical, obviously. obviously. Uh, that's my top. <laughs> Everything, from chimpanzee to chimpanzee. That's right. <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to talk Simpsons later, just let us know. We're ready for it. Um, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, why don't we play this last video and, and let it um, play us out? Do you want to tell us a little bit about what we're going to be seeing and hearing? Yeah, so this is a really fun piece. This is um, from my dissertation research, which was about a gamelan group in New York called Gamelan Son of Lion. And unlike a lot of the gamelan groups, including the one I direct here at Pitt, that focus mainly on teaching um, Indonesian music and um, cultural practices to that music, this is an ensemble that's dedicated itself to composing new music for gamelan. Um, so Barbara Benari was also an ethnomusicologist. She passed away just a few years ago um, while I was sort of finishing my research. Um, but she started this group in 1976. And this is a composition she made in 1979. And it's um, a sort of rare, not, not rare piece, but a, a more unusual piece for her in the sense that she's sort of using com composition as a way to understand a particular concept of um, Indonesian musical structures. In this case, that concept of Willet that I mentioned. Um, so she developed a, a certain framework that called the braid row. It's a little too much for right now, uh, but there's a melody you're gonna hear throughout. And she uses that concept of Willet to sort of expand the melody and kind of make it more complex and more dense as things get slower. So the faster they're playing, the just kind of the simpler iteration of the melody you'll hear. And as it gets slower, they'll start adding more notes and making it a little bit more complex. Okay. Yeah. So we can be paying attention to changes in that rhythmic density, hearing more notes in a span of time and seeing how the braid unfolds over time. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Um, Jay, Dr. J Arms, Dr. J, Dr. J, Dr. Jarms, um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you for actually, having me. Yeah, sharing all your experiences with us. Um, if folks want to, you know, see what you're up to or hear your projects or anything like that, where can we find you on the internet? I do have a website that is not very well maintained. It okay. should be more maintained. You can also go to the University of Pittsburgh Department of Music webpage. I have a profile there um, with some of the, the projects I've been working on a little bit more about me. And um, from there, you can find access to the University of Pittsburgh Gamel and stuff. There's also a YouTube channel and a podcast from Pitt that you can find fairly easily. Uh, look at uh, Music at Pitt podcast or just University of Pittsburgh music. Type in Pitt Gamelan, you'll find that video that we watched earlier and you find a lot of stuff that way. Jay, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah. Gabriel, if you wouldn't mind playing us out. Thank you so much to Gabriel Rivera for running all the tech today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Gabriel.
thing once, and then we'll do that together. You'll school from that thing. Play that little did? melody, little and then thing. we'll both end on that. Oh, I know all those people. All our old colleagues. Yeah, this was in graduate school um, with all my fellow Gamelan friends. We, yeah. yeah. I, I was there at a, a really odd moment where there was a bunch of graduate students who were all really into Gamelan and really good musicians. So we were able to uh, work on stuff like this. And actually, one of the musicians featured in that, or included in that video, um, Brian Bonbush, is going to join us in the spring for in the studio. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. No, Brian is a really interesting composer and just a great human being. Like, you'll, you'll all enjoy his visit. Yeah. Thanks again so much, Dave, for joining us and um, for sharing your music with us. It's a lot of fun. And um, yeah, now go take your dog for a walk. He's been <laughs> Yeah, he, he's ready. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Hope to see you next week. Um, and be well. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.